the audience is crying out, set Lola free. Good morning, our companions, brothers and sisters. With the set Lula Free, I will start our first panel of the International Conference. Some companions, brothers and sisters, and I already thank you for your willingness to be here with us in the end of the year, showing how important this international solidarity is and how important it is the set of activities we are going to conduct between today and tomorrow. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask João Pimenta, Euro uh, deputy by the Communist Party from Portugal. João Pimenta, you can just uh, pick whatever seat you want. Also to the floor, I will call our companion, George Tayana, an acquaintance of many of us, a representative from Palo Sur and ex uh, and former chancellor from Argentina. Thank you so much for coming. Our companion, federal representative, Maria do Rosario, former Minister of Human Rights of Dima Rousseff administration. Yeah, let's take a picture together because it adds value to myself when I take a picture with you. And also from the International Department of Syriza from Greece, Nectarius Bouganis. Bouganis, I'm sorry. Welcome. We had also planned to have in this first uh, panel our companion Fernando Daji, but unfortunately uh, he wasn't able to make it this morning. He called us and he's going to try to be here in the afternoon. Unfortunately, he apologizes, but uh, there was uh, something in his agenda he could not. Uh, do away with, and therefore he will try to get here for the second panel. Well, again, without any further ado, I would like to thank you very much for coming. Uh, my role here is to moderate this first panel, and the idea is to have 15 minutes for each one of you as uh, your opening remarks, and then we are going uh, to uh, take some questions from the audience, and then we are going back to the panel so that we can wrap up for lunch. So I'm going to start with uh, João Pimenta, uh, your representative that is next uh, to me, that is going to start with his opening remarks. Once again, I thank this first panel very much. And the topic is conservatism and the extreme right in today's world. We are going to have three topics, three panels. The first one is about conservatism. Then in the afternoon, democratic and progressive uh, answers. Uh, still today in the afternoon, then we are going to go to São Bernardo do Campo, and then tomorrow morning we have our last panel talking about alternatives and paths in the fight in defense of democracy. João, it's a pleasure to have you here. Once again, thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, before, on behalf of the Portuguese Communist Party, I would like to thank you for the invitation to attend this important conference and contribute uh, with um, my remarks to the work of this initiative. Also, 
uh, despite uh, his uh, absence, I would like to salute the candidacy of Fernando Haddad and other democratic and uh, important forces of Brazil that were together. And you had good results in very adverse conditions. The result is a value for you to continue to fight the fascist threat and uh, advocate for democracy in Brazil. The events of extreme right and fascism is today, as it was 90 years ago, a core issue of the international life. No matter where we look at, the international scenario is unstable, uncertain, with several conflicts and dangers. Peoples are confronted with huge challenges in the fight of their rights and aspirations. In the structural crisis of capitalism, a transformative fight is going on in a world that is changing in complex, difficult conditions, but shows real possibilities of resistance and advances. In the context of the deepening crisis of capitalism and its contradictions, processes to rearrange forces within the field starts to be more violent and criminal. Everywhere, it, mechanisms are being imposed for open dictatorship. Fascism is not a reaction to capitalism. It is a creation of capitalism to intensify exploitation and save the system. It is the most terroristic expression of power. It promotes uh, anti-communism. I'm going to pause uh, the speech so that the translators can follow me. And we thank you. And I salute the translators that have always a very difficult task. We thank you. <laughs> Promoting anti-communism, bellicism without breaks, authoritarianism, mechanisms of repression, the systematic destruction of structures and principles of the world order that was established after the defeat of Nazi fascism. And it happens everywhere. The most reactionary sectors of the dominant class bet on fascism more and more to come out of the structure crisis of capitalism. This is clear in the US with the Trump administration, also in Europe, as we have seen in the decisions of decisions of the European Union and several electoral processes. It's important to remind you that today the extreme right is already somewhat implied in 10 administrations of Europe. And it's also visible in Latin America, where the extreme right has a historical role and is aggressively installed in Brazil. The victory of Bolsonaro is the logical development of the process that started with the coup against Dilma Rousseff and the prison of Lula to prevent his candidature. This victory it starts with the offensive of imperialism in Latin America and in the world. And despite the courageous resistance of peoples throughout the world has been manifested in reactionary and unhuman decisions, as in the United States, attacking the rights of people and therefore uh, which led to, to what we saw in the world before. We can see examples of prepotence and a disregard for all political and human rights trying to put an end to organized resistance. We have the invasion of sovereign countries. We have torture, murder in communities, illegal actions against Cuba and Venezuela that are in constant threat of armed invasion. The commonplace 
took the crimes of Israel against the Palestinian people. The force, uh, armed forces retaining migration movements, businesses with drugs and other illegal movements. All that feeds an election like Bolsonaro. Much has been said about the right, talking about migration flows. What is the policy of imperialism that is in the base of this movement? And how the dominant uh, power deals with these movements? That grows inequalities in the countries that are involved. And that is one of the factors for the ultra-right and fascism to rise. The main imperialist centers show that it is from centers of powers that uh, the ultra-right steps are taken. And we can see that in the US policies and in several decisions of the European Council. Just like the US, the Trump policy tries to preserve the interests of the major capital and keep the imperialistic domination. The same happens in Europe. The ultra right does not oppose to the pillars of the European Union. Quite the opposite. Its actions and positions justify the reactionary policies of the European Union. On the other hand, the growth of ultra rights would not be possible without the schizophrenic media support exaggerating several fascist reactionary decisions with an ideological behavior that tries to build the phenomenon rather than fight it. This media offensive gives the instruments to nationalism to try to contrapose what we call the illusion of uh, traditional politics that are responsible for the inequalities of the right that was generated. That is, they tend to show the idea that the alternative to the risk of ultra-right is right. This has been witnessed in many elections in Europe. On the other hand, the mass media is concerned in a cynical way with the far right, connected by those same people that support the imperialist offensive in South America or the Nazi regime in the Ukraine. So the alleged combat that the European Union says it is fighting is not against the far right. So the combat against nationalism and the far right, which are the product of the evolution of the European Union, is used to attack those who are truly and historically on the opposite ideological camp that contests the process of capitalist integration in Europe who are in favor of social progress, democracy, and sovereignty, and the true cooperation and solidarity among peoples and states with equal rights. So in, on behalf of a fake combat to the far right, those that combat fascism are attacked, even if the far right ends up promoted through the mass media. So the fight against fascism will not be uh, consequent if we don't identify what feeds it. So the inequality is generated by capitalism, a social situation where the polarization of wealth has reached unprecedented levels, where unemployment and precarious work and work without rights are becoming more and more general. and promoting low wages, but also the inter interference uh, that challenges national sovereignty ends up feeding into fascism and racism. So fascism is not something that, are, that is inevitable, but must be combated with energy. No country is immune to the emergence of this phenomenon. In Portugal, there are rehearsals of solutions for uh, solutions like Bolsonaro's. And the idea is to contain the actual, the, the potential growth of progressive forces, for example, the Communist Party of Portugal, through a media campaign. 
in, the, in Portugal. Uh, notwithstanding the advances and achievements of the new uh, uh, moment of public life in Portugal, there remain enormous inequalities and structural dif difficulties in the country, which is a fruit of low investments over decades, and so inequalities remain at uh, unacceptable levels. So to condemn far-right and neo-fascism, and to be truly a true uh, a true condemnation, it we have to also attack the reductions in social and civil rights, which was the excuse of the, under the excuse of the war on terror, which ends up benefiting capitalist powers and economic corporations. So let us not forget that fighting fascism is not is incompatible with anti-communism. So anti-communism and fascism have always walked hand in hand. So we cannot uh, deal with fascism by ignoring the class nature of this phenomenon. So we have to organize workers' struggles for their interests and exposing the true nature of these forces and the system that generates and strengthens it and places it in, pow in power to reinforce its class power. So we have to go beyond repudiating the fascist menace. We must take sides in favor of the forces like the Communist Party of Portugal that uh, fight against the ideological roots of the monster and fight for democracy, social progress, and sovereignty with the idea of overcoming in a revolutionary fashion this system. With this expectation, we are looking to our Workers' Party and Communist Party uh, comrades here in Brazil and other progressive forces with a view to consolidating a broad democratic front that can put a stop to fascism and take up again the path of social progress, of sovereign development, uh, peace and cooperation that was initiated with Lula's election in 2002 in order to build a democratic, sovereign and prosperous Brazil, whatever the difficulties along the way. So we, the Portuguese communists, will never uh, fail to support you in fraternally in your struggle. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean Pimenta, for your talk. We hand over directly to Jorge Tayana, who is a member of the Parliament of the Mercosul, Parlasul. Thank you very much, Jorge, for coming here this morning and joining us today and tomorrow. Thank you. Artur, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here sharing with you in Argentina it's the 35th anniversary of the return of democracy the then president, Alfonsín, asked that the change in command at the end of the dictatorship at the start of the democratic period should happen on the 10th of December in honor of the relevance and the importance of the human rights. So there's a strong fight for justice and uh, truth uh, in our country. But Alfonsín said something very strong once, that he said that with democracy we eat, we take care of others, and we educate. So in these 35 years of democratic governments in Argentina, we have had governments that have been more conservative, more neoliberal, more pro-people, more pro-national governments, but regrettably we cannot say simply that with democracy one eats, 
one looks after one another and one educates. Uh, democracy is a form of coexistence, is a form of seeking to solve our differences peacefully, but democracy that we have, which are liberal democracies, are democracies with very little capacity to change the structural limitations of development and justice that we have uh, in our region. Perhaps for this reason, many of the governments that in Latin America, but mostly in South America, uh, gave a new impulse, a new will for change, for justice to transform our societies at the start of the 21st century, they were called the people's national democracies or progressive democracies or even populist democracy. The term populist did not begin with the European neo-right, uh, far right. It started with the Europeans uh, labeling us <laughs> because in fact, we wanted sometimes with constitutional changes, Bolivia, Ecuador or Venezuela on other cases without in Argentina and Brazil, we wanted more participative democracies because without more participative democracies, with, well, without greater presence of workers, of social movements, of the political forces in general, it would be very hard to bring about change that would go beyond the, 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 the games, the parliamentary games, which generally are very limited. So I want to stress two phenomena. We in the region were the first, we actually were the first region that that criticized more strongly uh, the neoliberalism that was imposed after the fall of the wall that was accompanied by two processes of democracy and market uh, liberalization. The neoliberalism, therefore, was, was similar in these two things in the sense that there were restrictions on the exercise of the power of the state. Not just in Latin America. This happened here in Eastern Europe, in Africa, and Asia. We were the first to react, saying, well, they're destroying the state. They're privatizing everything. The work, workers, the pro-worker legislation, we don't want that. That was with different uh, paces. That was the basic process that took place in our region here. And it happened in many cases after many movements, people's struggles in the streets, resistance, etc. So what happened here was a critique of the economic social model, but also of the model of democracy with one particularity, with one specificity. We in our region come from experiences in of authoritarian governments, governments of so-called national security. So the critique of democracy was based. We don't want uh, an authoritarian solution. We want more and better democracy. So the questioning of democracy came through and a deepening of democracy in the political, economic, and social fields. Because, because we must remind ourselves that, particularly in developed countries, a little bit less here because of the characteristics of our peripheral region, but the developed countries, Europe and the United States, liberal democracy, particularly after the Second World War, was based on three, on, on what? On the welfare state. And so the welfare state allowed the democracies, the liberal democracies established over decades in Europe were the way to solve 
conflicts. Why do I say this? Because to me it is clear what we are experiencing in many parts of the world, but particularly in developed countries, this neo-fascist wave is the result of the destruction of neo that neoliberalism took forward of the welfare state. So it's the destruction of the welfare state that created the ill feeling that we see in the streets of Paris, in, in Holland, in Belgium, and we're going to see in many places. This same uh, ill feeling that we had 20 years ago at the end of the 20th century. We're seeing that in, in Europe now. I don't want to, to blame, but reflect. And the truth is that we have to accept that much of this disassembly of the welfare state was done with the support, or at least without the opposition of many parts of the traditional left in Europe. When there was the development of the so-called third way in the first decade of the 21st century, what in fact was being done was to hold hands with the um, neoliberal tide. So this destruction of the welfare state and this um, giving up of the fight against the financialization of capital m made the left to be displaced. And this uh, locus of questioning of a critique of the status quo ended up being occupied, taken over by the, by the new right, the fascistic right. And that's the reality we have today. Here, we have similar things. We were all surprised. Our comrades from the Workers' Party in Brazil, the, the leaders of the Front for Victory in Argentina, we were all surprised that after 2008, the crisis of financialization of capital, we all thought the same thing. Now the rest of the world will fight neoliberalism and there will be a progressive wave in the rest of the world, particularly in Europe. And so Syriza emerged, Podemos emerged, and we have the example of Portugal, which I believe is the only country that managed to bring about a uh, capacity to change reality in a successful way, confronting a very different uh, neoliberal model in Europe. But we didn't have that wave. On the opposite, we had a counteroffensive of the financial capital of the, of the major power in our region, the United States, and of the local national forces that are oligarchical forces, that are concentrated power of media, of economic forces, of the agricultural sector, political and particularly with the incorporation of the uh, incorporation of the apparatus of the judiciary that were a little conservative or pro neoliberal but not pro fascist as they are revealing themselves to be now in many countries so this coming together of the alliance with the local right with the intention of the United States of taking back control over the the region and the fight against over the years with the war against with the war on terror uh, Latin America lost priority levels but today the greatest challenge for US security is the influence of China and Russia in Latin America. And what is clear, and uh, what Trump is doing is not Trump. That's the US power that is once again uh, emphasizing the blockade on Cuba and Venezuela and want every, wants everyone to um, break relations with Venezuela, which is what they did with Cuba in the 60s, to, in other words, to drive the whole of the, the 
countries of the region to support the idea of the American backyard and the Monroe Doctrine. So these are very little democratic policies, of course. So I, have, I want to stress that the fight for democracy and against fascism cannot be a fight that is limited to the political forms. We can base our defense of democracy, which is the defense of coexistence. Of course, we don't want people to be killed, right? Like they did in Paraíba just over the weekend and that legislation should be, should be respected. Of course, that is important and is necessary, and it's important to denounce any violations. Just a minor digression here. We have to go back to some things that we've been doing for some years, which is the coordination of the efforts in many cases of the grassroots organizations to develop solidarity at regional level, at international level, and to expose the cases of violations of rights to the rest of the international community with a broad democratic range of spectrum that will listen. But we have to do it systematically because they are not yet convinced of what we are experiencing is what we say. Many people around the world think that that what we are experiencing is the end of populism and that's a welcome thing. So they are letting this right, this neo-right, seem modern or democratic, quote unquote. But the bad news is that this right, this neo-right, is neither modern nor democratic. It's a bloodthirsty, oligarchical, uh, pro-minority, and they want the destruction of any and every alternative to their power, people-based power. That is why we cannot be confused. So that's why the, present, the imprisonment of Lula has an importance all over this continent and even globally. So my recommendation is outwards. We have to have a campaign in defense of democracy, but inwards, at national level, the defense of democracy cannot be a defense that is exclusively or mainly of the Republican and liberal level. It has to be a substantive defense. The way of opposing fascism is to defend workers, peasants, the labor legislation, their retirees, the students, and all the social movements. We cannot give as a present to the right wing, the populist, fascist, the representation of those that feel the ill, the Ill feelings uh, with neoliberalism. In Argentina, we have even something worse. We, we had the victory of a, of a political force called Let Us Change. How can the conservative forces call themselves Let Us Change? And we are in favor of social transformation for, for a fairer society. We lost. So there are things that clearly we have to be able to review and uh, go more in depth. So my advice is the defense of democracy is the defense of a democracy that is substantial, that is broad ranging. So we cannot say that we accept a step back. No, we have to defend everything that the pro-people governments did. And the only way to defeat fascism is to advance in defense of the, the rights of the majority of the people in the struggle against the minority, the oligarchicals, so to end with privileges and integration of the peoples. Thank you very much. Free Lula. Thank you. 
comrade uh, George Diana, as always, helping us uh, dearly with his talk in this uh, panel to understand the advance of our rights in the world, in the region. And very briefly, I have two uh, messages uh, for you. First, we have a positive problem. I always like to say positive problems. I like positive problems. The thing is, the room is full, and we have people standing. So for we were able to have a room uh, next to here with live streaming, and there are chairs over there. So if if you like it, you can also, if you are very young, you can sit, just sit down on the floor. But if not, you can go to the room adjacent to this, and we are streaming this panel in there as well. Second, I would like to let you know that uh, uh, our comrade from Syriza is going to speak English. So if you need the translation equipment, do not forget to get your earphones. And now it is an honor to give the floor to Maria do Rosário. Not only because uh, her history uh, in defense of human rights, uh, and, and but especially today, that uh, sets the date of 100 years of the Declaration of Human Rights. It's a pleasure to have you here. Well, it's a pleasure, it's all mine. Thank you. I would like to greet Artur Henrique, Fundação Perseu Amanto, the International Committee, Lula Livre, I also uh, re embrace our colleagues from this panel, Jean Pimenta, Jorge Tayana, Bogdanis, that is here as well, and you all, and uh, Comrade Glaze Hoffman, our president, that uh, not by chance is coming back from Paraíba because she was there with uh, the MST, the Rural Landless Movement, and that is the mission of uh, the Workers' Party, to be together with social movements in their fight. You know that MST and also urban movements that uh, fight for housing the whole set of social movement led to us choosing President Lula as a candidate to, uh, for the presidency. We'll never forget this time. That shows the connection of Lula and the Workers' Party with the social fight and this movement. And I really come greet Glazy for representing us against this act of hatred and fascism against the MST and against life. So thank you very much for representing us in all our struggles and fights. So I consider this conference, Arthur, that talks about democracy in the milestone of the 100 years of the Declaration of Human Rights is a conference that is extremely important because it unifies and works with these two concepts that always have Professor Ducey to be worked on and considered as one. We generally say that democracy does not exist with human rights and vice versa. And we know that very well because the tone, the fight for human rights in our countries against fascism has always been that that strengthened the pathways for democracy. In Brazil, we know that the fighting against fascism in Brazil in the period of uh, the military dictatorship has to do with advocates of human rights that are represented parties, institutions that lost many of their members, murdered by dictatorship. That's how PT, the Workers' Party started, but also uh, PC, uh, uh, the Communist Price, uh, Party of Brazil. So we know lives destroyed by authoritarianism. 
but we produce consensus in the contemporary world in view of this concept, democracy and human rights. In this relationship, we produce a concept and we accept it as the left, an idea that we would be on a level that we would not go back liberal democracy as it was installed would be irreversible. We have to say that because when we have room for democracy, and this is what this moment is teaching us above all, when there is a window for the air to come in with regard to democracy and freedom, we cannot accommodate to the patterns of democracy, of liberalism, of formal representative uh, representation, and electoral democracy. And this is what happened to us in the recent history. We are the workers' parties and parties that work with us, and we believe deeply in democracy. But with parties that dispute electoral processes that are part of the parliament, with parties that dispute majority elections, we are part of this democracy as if it were the only democracy. And what we see is that the forces of the right fascist segments, reactionary segments, when they see that democracy does not need to a level of substantial changes incorporating human rights as political, deep rights of citizenship, of power over the state, of economic, social rights, cultural, environmental rights, as in the Declaration of Human Rights that we see, and in the Pact of Political Rights of 1996, and the determination of human rights in a contemporary world, universality, indivisibility. When we do not move democracy with human rights, and we stick to democracy as an electoral representation according to the liberal world, the right comes to power. And it comes to power because it does not accept liberal democracy. The far right is the denial of liberal democracy. No milestones of liberalism are accepted even by the far right. There are fundamental principles that we believe that are in the pact of uh, humanity when you talk about declaration of human rights. The guarantee of a fair trial. Who has a fair trial? Not the poor, not the black, not the social misfits, and not President Lula. If you are on the side of the social misfits, if you are on the side of the poor that never had any rights, you will not have a free independent trial, which is one of the articles of the Declaration of Human Rights that was deeply violated when we think of prisons in Brazil and that was deeply violated in the objective situation of President Lula. Yes, it's a matter of social classes. Democracy is also a matter of social classes to us because it has to be completely recomposed on top of culture. We, the workers' class, men and women that want to build the freedom of rights to all, and the rich and the political elites of our nations adhering to powerful segments, to neoliberalism, as Marcel Poshman mentioned. 
that renounces the liberal dimension in the political sense of it and also several elements in the economic part of it and becomes a force that uh, just focuses on the accumulation of capital. Limited democracy, therefore, is one of the elements that make us step back and it feeds reactionary segments. Where were these segments? Where were those reactionaries when we knew people had uh, some shame in saying that they favored uh, dictatorship and the dissemination of the Indians and the black. They were producing a reaction to all the advances that we were able to get. They were culturally building individualism, the lack of solidarity and they were gauging society by values that are potentially shown as religion, but basically fighting against uh, individual rights, the feminists, the LGBT population, groups, vulnerable populations, creating a state and feeding a state of police that we always had in Brazil. And we always had in Brazil because some structures in Brazil in its bureaucracy have not really gone through any transition. It's not by chance that the Constitution of 1988 that is this year turning 30 years old and it incorporated the principles of the Declaration of Human Rights has not approached the content of policy, police, or the military powers and repression. So I would like to share with you, differently from Argentina and Uruguay, Brazil did not go through a transition process, really building culture against authoritarianism or the violence of the state. In the last uh, truck driver strike, we saw posters on the streets and also attacks against President Dilma and President Lula, and people were claiming for military intervention and dictatorship. That led to the election of an advocate of one of the worst tortures Brazil has experienced. Brazil was one of the last countries of having a commission of truth. And in terms of uh, lessons learned uh, of those that really work hard and try to establish a public policy, it was the fight of Mario Miranda and the family members of those that were tortured. It was the fight of a generation. It was a fight of President Lula, President Dilma, to have a national commission of truth. But when we do something with regard to human rights, to fight against fascism and the culture it feeds, we have to go to the end. And we in Brazil put together a national, national commission of truth, but we did not get to the end of it. We did not see it through. We did not. Not before, when it was uh, put together, and not when we started to, to operate with it. It did not have the powers to establish a dialogue with the population, to teach and show them that uh, fighting for dictatorship means the death of your children the kidnapping and disappearance of youngsters, torture. We were not able to show to Brazil what torture is. And even 
if we have established laws against torture, even if we have talked to, to the United Nations about fighting against torture, we in Brazil, in the democratic picture, period, forgot to mention that torture was a practice against the black, against the poor, inside the prisons. We did not address this topic to the end. Very well then. Without a democratic culture, we have regression. Because fascism feeds from the torture it practices. Before and during the democratic period, it was hidden, but it was unpunished. Now, there is support of those that by means of elections that were marked by fake news, fraud, and impediment of Lula to be candidate were elected in for the presidency of Brazil, an adorer of torture. Our, the president is a representative of hatred. And if it is more difficult to fight against hatred and fight fascism, because now it takes over a face inside the state and it's clearly free for violence, death, and repression against social movements. Yes, it is more difficult, but it has never been as important to reassess our step, to resume aspects of liberal democracy but not to be inside this democracy. We have to know that we either advance to a more substantive, participative initiative, putting together democratic values and democratic norms, or we will be under the domination of authoritarianism. I would also like to say that we have to be in solidarity internationally against all fascist movements in the world because the background here is not just uh, customs and habits, religions, an attack to specific groups. This is just the pathway through which fascists come to power and dispute the minds of population and they deny Article 1st of the Declaration of Human Rights that I hear quote, all human beings are, are born equal in dignity and rights. They have reason and consciousness, and they should act towards one another in the spirit of fraternity, because it's reason and consciousness that is being attacked now with anti until intellectualism, with a culture of superstition, a culture of fundamentalism, where, where what has less value is the lives of those that oppose to subordination and pillage, because they are taking away the wealth of Brazil, the life of Brazil solidarity internationally and be together integrating human rights and democracy. It is a special time for all of us because after all, my friends, President Lula is an advocate of human rights. He was so when he fought poverty, when he created programs of all kinds when he created the National Commission for the Eradication of Slave-like Work. That was Lula who created that. He removed more than 40,000 people from slave-like conditions. That established eating as a human right in Brazil that was able to establish the idea that people had rights by himself. And today, he is a political prisoner because human rights are no longer in force in Brazil. 
even in limited fashion as they were in the past. And democracy is arrested together with Lula, and we need to free it. Thank you. Thank you, Maria do Rosário. This important moment that we are experiencing, words such as yours help us to organize the resistance and the struggle So, for Lola's freedom. So we hand over to our comrade of the International Department of Cities, Darius Bogdanis. with the emergence of a new extreme right that is otherwise called on alternative right. This alternative right is the career of all the repulsive ideas of racism, xenophobia, homophobia, sexism, and at the same time, this alt-right strongly supports the big capital and all the neoliberal policies. In European Union, there are politicians and leaders from conservative and extreme right who threaten Europe with nationalism and finally, as a result, a new war 80 years later after the end of the Second World War. Independence Party in Britain, Marie Le Pen in France, Salvini in Italy, Orban in Hungary, Kurz in Austria, AFD in Germany are few only of this extreme league. The main reasons of the rising of extreme or alt-right in Europe are, firstly, the destructive consequences of the long-term austerity imposed by neoliberalism. Secondly, xenophobia reinforced by refugee flows from Asia and Africa and the social impasse of second generation emigrants in the suburbs of big European cities. Third, the weakness of the social and economic convergence of the small ones with the major European countries. Four, the imaginary search of a supposedly brilliant past that, as they say, is in danger from people of from other religions and cultures. And last one, the dangerous shift to extreme views from politicians of the traditional conservative right in order not to lose their politi political audience. At the same time, in some countries, there are the opposite image. For example, in Spain and Portugal, the socialist government supported by the left and the Greens. In Greece, the government of Syriza defends the majority of the population, implementing social policies and fight against the conservative and extreme right. The end of bailouts after eight years of an ex excruciating austerity is, of course, a major achievement of the Greek government. Securing universal health care coverage and free access to public hospitals for the uninsured. Establishing a humanitarian program at first 
and a universal guaranteed income afterwards. Introducing school lunches, starting from the poorest neighborhoods where child poverty was increased. Free public transport for the unemployment. Protecting low and middle income households from back seizures. Where measures, all these were measures extremely important to stabilize society and the economy while waiting for the storm to pass. The nationalization of a public transport in the city of Thessaloniki and the retention of the electric power grid and the water utilities under public ownership were a few successes that, were, that went against the privatization pressures of the Troika. Our parallel program, including doubling investment on university innovation research, extending civil rights to same-sex couples, expansion of civil pact for the same-sex couples, legisl legislation of social gender, recognition and child fostering rights, providing access to citizenship to emigrants and their children, expanding child care by 50% and distributing an allowance at the end of each year to the 10% of the lower incomes. With the person of their families, this increased to 30% of the lower incomes. At the end of the bailout, the government has announced the, cancell the cancellation of major neoliberal reforms that were imposed by previous governments. The restoration of the collective labor agreements framework their extension to all workers at its employment sector, the gradual raise of the minimum wage at its pre-crisis levels, and the abolition of the insulting sub-minimum wage for the under 25 years old workers. The economy is growing again, 2.15% for the first half of 2018, and the unemployment has substantially fallen by approximately 8.5% from 27% in 2015, 18.6% now, after three and five, three half year of our government. In the refugee crisis, we helped about 1.3 million refugees to pass through Greece with safety to North Europe. Now we host more than 60,000 refugees, and at the same time, the, ri the richest, richest countries than Greece in Europe deny to host one or 2,000 refugees. Finally, I would like to say that for us in Greece, the inspiration from Latin America has been re and remains precious. The names of Lula, Dilma Rousseff, Chavez, Morales, Kirchner, and before them, Fidel Castro and Subcomandante Marcos have been the subject of discussion and admiration many times. The great experience of left-wing governance brought by Latin America and its result have created many enemies. Judicial coups, spreading fake news, all in the service of defeat of the left. Nowadays, a progressive front of all the progressive powers is necessary than ever against extreme right and neoliberalism. This is exactly that we are trying to organize in Europe the European Forum of Progressive Powers. One year ago in Marseille, France, and one month ago in Bilbao, Spain, leftists, Greens, and Social Democrats against neoliberalism organized three days of discuss about the present and the future. I would like at this very important conference to testify on behalf of Syriza a specific proposal to upgrade our joint país in a historic period of rapid upheavals of the new extreme right. We need a worldwide network of progressive forces 
on the model of Foro de Sao Paulo, which will gather progressive political forces from the European and American continent and will seek to expand with similar forces, simil similar forces from Africa, Africa and Asia. This network could organize big international conferences at least every two years and in different continents each time and in the meantime could coordinating Forum One representative politically and geographically committee. For a modern and democratic international network which is able to give answers in the new big questions of our time. Comrades, the fight is crucial. These ages are strange and difficult many times, but we have the power. Because people get the power, we need unity, solidarity, fantasy, and we'll succeed. No to racism, no to war. For a future with democracy and defense of human rights. I, we, we are watching at Syriza the new elected president of, of Brazil, Mr. Bolsonaro, and we think that the way that he wants is not very easy for him. We think that the movement in Brazil and Latin America is very strong to fight against Mr. Bolsonaro or anyone else who wants to fight against human rights and democracy. Be strong, solidarity, unity, and Lula Livre. Thank you. Muito obrigado, Nectaris. Quer dizer, já temos aí uma uma proposta, né, uma discussão a ser feita não só pelo seminário, mas por todos os participantes. É, como nós começamos um pouco... Little late. And we have the second panel this afternoon. We wanted to really start at 1.30 because, as we all know, we have an important activity in São Bernardo. So our idea is to open five or six uh, contributions. If everybody agrees, let's try to keep them between international and Brazilian uh, comrades. So we had some activities Saturday and Sunday of the Forum of Sao Paulo. So the idea was to have five or six uh, interventions from the floor that would nevertheless give us the opportunity for the panelists to respond. So we are taking now raise your credential so so we have our Senator Suplicy so Ricardo Carneiro our great economist comrade any more? So now I'm going to hand over. to our uh, contributions from the floor. So we start off with Andressa. Nascimento Almeida, three minutes. Good morning, everyone. I want to greet you for, thank you for the opportunity to be here. All the organizers, the participants, I'm going to read my uh, contribution here. We are experiencing 
crisis of capitalism, a, a conflict between civil society, human rights, in opposition to the restructuring of capitalism in the face of the technological industrial revolution that has changed work relations that have been the basis of the left globally. So there has been a general uh, change in historical uh, forms of resistance. The greatest symbol of the left and people's organizations and the advance of democracy have been progressive governments. They are undergoing a major blow, the same that uh, brought down President Tilma and arrested President Tilma. We need to restructure the democratic structures to make democracy the fight, the power for the people. So to change individual representations, parliaments, inspired in houses of laws for a democratic model with broad ranging people's uh, organizations with a role for the organizations that emerge in the democratic process. So bringing together the people's agenda as human rights advocates, we must have civil disobedience to overcome the violence of the system. Our paradigm in the global order is for sustainability, communi communion, equity, and justice. We need to put the brakes on what technological uh, production allows, which is excessive consumerism and exhaustion of raw material, natural resources. So new work relations are imposed, reducing the number of people, fewer jobs, and concentrating even more the wealth. And what we are experiencing today, today we have to be the continuation of the Arab Spring. It's a chaotic convulsion, which is part of this new configuration of the forces of capital. Our challenge and task is to be organized politically around the struggle of social movements and people's manifestations, an ideological conflict, which means raising our awareness of the moment and the new relations, fighting for political reforms, legal reforms, and communication reforms, a political offensive that implies reviewing the concept of class in, within these changes, noticing the intersection between race, gender, class, and economic oppressions, which means confronting underrepresentation, the demand for the power to participation. Let us return to our spaces, to our organizations, ready to sow the seed that another world and another democracy are possible and necessary and are up to us. Lula Livre. Thank you, Andressa. O Ricardo Carneiro. Our advisor for economic, social, and political issues. Good morning, everyone. I have a question that's a bit of a provocation to the panel. The thing is the following. Uh, Parchman says it, and uh, he raised some hypothesis to understand what's going on. But I believe that today, uh, the idea that we are uh, thinking of a reaction of capital against substantive democracy is a good idea. And in fact, it has happened before in the uh, obstruction of order. It is an, an interesting idea, but it is incomplete because it does not explain the adherence of the masses. And this is a topic we should investigate because we have just experienced that in Brazil. And we are seeing that uh, elsewhere, masses buying the project. And I think this is part of the discussion that we should uh, deepen into. I think there are some suggestions that are important here in the case of Brazil and even in the world. We have uh, the capitalism creating 
a new quote unquote middle class that is much more defined by its, uh, its pattern of consumption than its own structure. Then we have the predomination of the short term views. These are very important issues to make masses move. Uh, in the case of Brazil, this can also be associated to the issue of religions that today dominate a vast part of uh, Brazilian social classes, ideological, economic, political uh, movements. And we have to try to explain what is the most difficult to explain. It is what we have to try to focus on, which is that we are losing part of the message to the project. I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you, Ricardo. Now we have Representative Eduardo Suplicy and then Paola Estrada. It is an honor to have you all here. and also the promotion of the event by the International Committee. Well, good morning, everyone. Well, first of all, I would like to say a word to Maria do Rosário uh, that was offended in such a horrible way by the elected president when he said that you did not even deserve to be raped. I would like to tell you, Maria do Rosário, that if we're not so much in love with my companion <laughs> based on your beauty and uh, the beautiful words that you pronounce today, <laughs> and if it weren't for the fact that you have someone, I would certainly ask you to go out with me. <laughs> in solidarity to you based on what the elected president mentioned. But anyway, I would like to say some. The elected president, soon after the election, uh, gave an interview saying that before God and the Brazilian people, he would uh, abide by our constitution. Well, Article 3rd of our constitution says the following. It, it addresses the main objectives of our nation, including eradicating poverty and promoting equality. If he indeed wants to do that, as it happened in Greece with uh, the party of uh, Mr. Boganis uh, that said that want to have an inter inter in universal basic income. And remember, the National Congress approved, even when Jair Bolsonaro was a federal representative, and he did not vote against it, which is the progressive implementation of a basic income. And then we have to think of Bolsonaro's program that was submitted to the Electoral Committee a value above a minimum income to all Brazilian families. All these ideas, including the Bolsa Familia, are based on thinkers as Friedman. Our goal is to guarantee to any Brazilian worker an income that is equal or superior to our Bolsa Familia today. In the year 2000, April 11th, 2000, I interviewed, I had an interview with Milton Friedman and James Sullivan, two laureates of the Nobel Prize. And I asked them what they thought of a basic income or a citizen's income. And they replied, quote, a basic income or a citizen income is not an alternative to the negative income tax. It's another way to introduce uh, equality if it is followed by a positive income. 
as mentioned by Professor Philip Langlais, the greatest authority about this in this book that was just published, Basic Income and Extreme Proposal for a Free Society, the statement of Milton Friedman says basically that they are in favor of a negative income tax and basic universal income. Therefore, if Jair Bolsonaro effectively wishes to eradicate poverty and promote equality and even bring together the Brazilian population, He'll have to abide by that, because in the programs of Ciro Gomes, Fernando Haddad, Guilherme Boulos, Marina Silva, all said that they are in favor of the implementation of a basic citizen's income. So if Jair Bolsonaro wants to, he may really abide by the Constitution. Thank you very much, Suplicy. And now we are going to have Paola Estrada. Good morning, everyone, our comrades. Uh, how uh, to introduce me? I am a member of ALBA and I'm also the Lula Leaf International Committee. First, I would like to salute the Foundation for coordinating the seminar and all our comrades for your fantastic uh, presentations, especially Maria do Rosario, that really touched me with her words, bringing lessons to the left uh, for the years to come. Briefly, however, I would like to talk about uh, a conviction of mine. I am part of the Bolivarian articulation, and I would like the panel to talk about uh, this topic. In several talks, uh, comrades brought uh, the importance of internationalism and an international action now that neo fascism is spreading throughout the world together with the far right. But quite often, we from the left, not only in Brazil, uh, we are against neo fascism in Brazil, but we keep silent uh, against neo fascism in other places in the world, especially in the Bolivia Republic of Venezuela. We see there an advance of the far right. Opposition is showing its uh, traits of fascism when once again tried to, to have a coup with the murdering of blacks and Bolivarian militants. And what is at stake is the sovereignty of the Venezuelan people that have been saying for more than 20 years that they are freely voting for the maintenance of Bolivarian Chavez administrations. And we, as progressive militants of the left and the international fight uh, defense against, uh, for democracy, cannot keep quiet about the sovereignty of Venezuela. With all uh, criticism we can have about the government, I mean, uh, there are always negative aspects of everything, but we have to pay attention to that. We Latin Americans, Brazilians, have now, with the election of Bolsonaro in Brazil, an articulation of the right mainly focus on knocking down administrations that are still in power. And Venezuela is in the core of this offensive. We see recently an approval of the United Nations to have humanitarian humanitarian help in Venezuela, and we know very well what it means and what it, what it has caused in the Middle East and in our continent. So I would like to draw your attention to this, and I would like the panel to comment on that. Thank you, Paola. And now, Ivanildo de Deus, and then Ricardo Cantu. Good morning, everyone. 
uh, first of all, I would like to stress that Brazilian democracy that has always been frail has always suffered the interference of other empires, England, uh, Portugal, and after the Second World War from the US. And that translated into a frailty of Brazilian democracy. Even the interference of uh, major international and national capital, the expressive interference of the United States, this National Congress, particularly today, having several ruralistic and uh, evangelical groups and what we call the group that uh, is in favor of weapons. These are elements of the national conservatism and our judicial branch that is completely partial, an international shame. This judicial power that is so partial and that has acted the greatest farce of Brazil, which is the prison without proof of President Lula. And also the military bias that has always been in our country, holding political power in Brazil, which contributed to this democratic frailty a historical social inequality in the country also contributing to that. And so many state administrations. I would like us to think about that. Our left or center left state administrations absorbed physiological practices of typical of the Brazilian and the international right and failed to contribute to social movements and to democracy. That has to be thought of. And another thing that we have to highlight is the following, that we still were not able to consolidate a front of left parties in Brazil. And we have to put it together to fight for democracy. Because in Brazil, we never had the respect of dominant classes and elite for democracy. It's time now for us to take action and invest in the solidification of social movements to make a change in the structure of this country. Set Lula free. Thank you very much, Ivanildo. Now, Ricardo Contu and then Isabel Frontona Caldas. Thank you. I salute you solidarity from the Workers' Party of Mexico. Celebrando el triunfo electoral, este primero de diciembre se tomó protesta. December the 1st, that Andres Manuela took office, the new president of Mexico, and after major electoral frauds that took place in Mexico, we finally got progressive left forces to the government. But that uh, uh, has been very expensive to oligarchies and the right. Uh, if they hadn't committed electoral frauds, they would not have had the majority in parliament. That will enable us them to act also against uh, the new order. And we send uh, our solidarity from Mexico. We are with you supporting you, and from Mexico, we hope we can all join together and enter American processes that we should never have abandoned. Lula Livre. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. And also, we congratulate you on the president's victory. Now we are going to have Isabel Frontona and then 
Carlos Serrano. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for your talks. I am Isabel Fontana Casas. I represent the Committee of Collectives for Democracy and Lula Livre. We have several collective groups that are also represented here, several comrades, Solidari uh, Flores da Resistência, Solidari na Rua. She's naming the groups that are here today. And uh, we are going to hold Christmas with Lula. And I would like to emphasize that because it's very important that comrades from outside of Brazil are able to attend. You know that the local, uh, the national press is not going to talk about that. And we believe that you have to spread the word. Remember that this is not only an act of love and solidarity towards President Lula. It's also a political action. Uh, that is rooted in the meaning of Christmas. The idea is to have an interreligious act, and it's very important that the whole of the world knows of that and pays attention to this moment, that it's not only love, solidarity, and celebrating Christmas together with President. It is a political act for the freedom of Lula and for the rights of all nations and diversity and plurality that has always been present in our country and in Latin America. And finally, I have a question. You all had fantastic talks, Maria do Rosário specifically. Uh, in her analysis, and I, I'm not saying that it was criticism, it was critique, and I think it's very important that it serves all of us, all democratic countries that have flaws and have to try, have tried to implement liberal democracy. Liberal democracy has strong limitations. And then you have to dispute narratives uh, with the right and now with the far right. So there were always uh, areas of the Workers' Party that uh, defended participative democracy and uh, popular participation. We had excellent uh, experiences, not only of popular participation, which is the referendum or other mechanisms, but mechanisms that we have created for the participation of people. We had the participated budgeting that was indeed a call for the population to partner with the government to make political decisions, to make economic decisions. So I believe in participative democracy. And I would ask you, if you can, to comment a bit on that, because I think this is one of the possibilities for us to continue fighting. And democracy is not only in effect when we are in power. We have to do this exercise within our parties, within our groups, within our initiatives. Thank you very much, Isabel. Before I turn the floor to Carlos Fonseca, Perin, I would like to leave you a message. The owner of cruiser car license plate uh, 0656, you left the car in the parking lot, but you brought uh, the keys with you, so no one can go in or out of the parking lot. So if you have a cruiser GCT 0656, please go pick up your car. Carlos, where are you? Oh, here you are. Thank you. So, dear comrades, I'm Carlos Fonseca Teran of the Sandinista Front of National Liberation. We are taking part in an important activity of the Sao Paulo Forum in which we, among other things, are promoting the 
the creation of an anti-fascist front in our continent and globally. We exist. Sometimes we forget our friends, but our enemies never forget. So, so Donald Trump has given us the the honor of including the Nicaragua in the Troika of Tyranny together with Cuba and Venezuela. That has to do with the advances of the Sandinistan Revolution, among them the reduction of social inequality and poverty and the creation of people's power in terms of politics and economics. So that has meant we created class consciousness and revolutionary consciousness. So we consider the universal values can can only be de defended by surpassing bourgeois democracy and with the exercise of power directly by the people. We have just overcome an intent of violent overthrow of our government promoted by U.S. imperialism. We defeated that attempt, which was a maneuver of the imperialists that intended to overthrow the Sandinista government that was elected with 73% of the votes of the Nicaraguan people. We want to express our solidarity, unconditional solidarity, to our brother Lula, who is a friend of President of Daniel Ortega, President of uh, Nicaragua, and we add ourselves to this campaign. We've already been taking part in it, demanding the freedom of our brother Lula da Silva, Lula Libre. Your credential, Carlos. Okay. So, now, we will um, now return to the panelists. Thank you all for your participation. Forgive my bossiness, but we are on a tight schedule. We're trying to do our best to uh, conclude our proceedings here by 12.30. So what Isabel said is very important. We're not talking only about that this international solidarity is fundamental, but more important than that is to be able to pierce the media blockade that happens in all of our countries when we have the advance of the far right. So. This international participation, our comrades uh, disseminating our activities, our demonstrations, everything that is that has to do with what is taking place in Brazil is of crucial importance to be able to cut through the blockade and make sure that more people are made aware of what is going on in our country. So once again, um, I'm going to do the opposite order from the left to right, not that Tayana is on the far right, but he'll be the last one to speak. So thank you all once again. So we hand back to our brother from Syriza. The words of contributors. You know, in Greece, we have an openly neo-Nazi party, the Golden Dawn, that they took 7% on double elections on 12 and double elections on, 15, on 2015. On elections on 2009, Golden Dawn took 0.5%. What happened in three years until 12 and the Golden Dawn took 7%? A half of million, millions of votes. Look, uh, there is, there is a... The, maybe the worst newspaper, Sunday newspaper in Greece, Protothema, it's uh, called. Um, in, in a Sunday edition on 2011, they, they, they uh, published a picture. This picture is from the inner city of Athens, two small old women uh, in front of ATM. And b behind of them, two big, huge uh, members of Golden Dawn with masculus and two meters tall, and uh, protected them from the emigrants that they are ready 
to stolen the, the, the old ladies. One year, one year uh, after one year, another uh, newspaper, he revealed that these, these uh, old ladies were mothers of the senior uh, members of Golden Dawn. And all this is a fake news. But nobody hears about this. One year, one year earlier, all Greece, before, before, uh, because Protothema is the first new, uh, Sunday newspapers because they, they give uh, gifts uh, and benefits uh, to the people, knows that, wow, in the inner city of Athens, the members of Golden Dawn protected the poor old ladies. It's the only, it's the only reason that the Golden Dawn took from 0%, 7%, not, because it's not only the reason, because the, and this is that I was trying to say in my speech before that extreme right and neoliberal, neoliberal policies and corruption uh, uh, work together. The corruption only, only in healthcare, public healthcare in Greece, the last two years, 20 years before our government, from 1995 to 2015, the corruption in public health care was 85 billion euro. The total national debt of Greece is 300 and 320 billion euros. The 25 percent of national debt came only for national public health care from the governments of uh, conservative New Democracy and Social Democrat PASOK. And the people were uh, uh, very, very, uh, they, fe they feared, there, uh, there, there was a fear in the people that the neoliberalism and the bad immigrants stolen our lives. And the Golden Dawn was there to, to change from an openly neo-Nazi group to a nationalism, nationalist uh, party. But there are openly, openly neo-Nazi with Nazi salute and etc. But this is the time, these years from 2010 to 2015, that Syriza, with a lot of people, was on the front of movement against neo neoliberalism and Golden Dawn. And this is the reason that Golden Dawn took seven and not 17 or 20 or 30 percent like other European countries. Because the left was there. The left was on the movements, inside the movements, and talk democratically with the people of the movements without hegemonies or other problems. And on 2015, a, a little a uh, few months, maybe one year before the election of 15, in polls, Golden Dong took about 15 percent. And the last, in the last year before the elections, is that Syriza, front, in front of the, the movement against neoliberalism, asked from people to vote for left, to change the things, because they, the people are, were disappointed from National Democrats, PASOK, a, a full corrupt, corrupted party and conservative new democracy. And the, the people said, okay, maybe, maybe we vote Golden Dawn to punish them for one time. We, maybe, maybe we, a lot of people said that, true, that's true. A lot of people say, maybe for one time, vote for Golden Dawn to punish these corrupted people. But Syriza said, no, no, there is no one time because they are fascists, they are neo-Nazi, they are, they are neoliberalism at the same time. So vote for Syriza, so vote for left to change the things. And, the, and on double elections, on 2015, the people change and vote for Syriza. And we are sure that on the elections on 2019, we will, do it, we will take a more, four, more four years in the government. But this is not the only one that we need in Europe and all over the world. Not only Greece, not only Spain, not only Portugal, not only 
Ireland and Sinn Féin, we need, we need PT in Brazil, we need uh, Kirchner uh, in Argentina, we need uh, Venezuela, we need Morales in Bolivia, we need to expand the paradigm, to extend the, the paradigm that against neoliberalism and extreme rights, the left and with the progressive powers could take the power as a first step to a totally uh, power on the future. Thank you. Thank you, Nectarius. So now I hand over to our comrade John Pimenta, uh, member of the European Parliament. Okay. So talking about the, the masses, the question about the adherence of the masses to the far-right parties. The history gives us some clues about the reasons, whether more recent history or in the past century. It is enough to look at what was the arrival in power in Germany, in Italy, even in Portugal, of, of fascist forces. They were not coups. It was through processes that were democratically legitimized. And we take the view that we cannot uh, cease, we cannot stop looking at history. We have to characterize the different moments in history, but there are always parallels that we can trace between what we are living today and what we lived in the past. And the use in a demagogical way of what is the mass discontent of people the manipulation, we cannot forget the 20s when Mussolini and Hitler arrived in power. They were, uh, uh, they were undergoing a major global uh, crisis. There were huge inequalities, uh, extreme poverty that was affecting the populations, not by chance that what is today used used that we call today fake news. It's not a new thing, right? The scale is different, but the speed of dissemination is different. But the concept isn't. I can't forget we were the day before the second round of the elections, and the news started circulating by WhatsApp. That, that the candidate of the Workers' Party was basically a pedophile rapist. So there's a purpose behind that. So Goebbels used to say that a, a lie sufficiently repeated becomes the truth. And now there are lots of lies being disseminated much more quickly with the use of technology. And and capital controls them. They have the way to control them. They have the means to control them. The progressive forces don't have the capacity to respond, at least in the same scale. So in an article that I wrote recently for a magazine of the Communist Party of Portugal called The Militant, I was talking about the historical roots of fascism. I was. Uh, alerting that there was no coincidence between uh, Hitler uh, arriving in power by calling his party the National Socialist Party because the Soviet Union was consolidating itself with uh, social advances and development uh, taking place. So it's not by chance that that name was chosen by the Nazis. So this uh, demagogic statement that Mussolini said that he was at the same time a revolutionary and a reactionary 
these are statements that we can still today hear in the mouths of certain European movements that are called populist. We don't like that term, of course, because it has two functions, to mask the fascistic uh, far-right character of these movements, and it puts into the same bag, as I said in my initial talk, very different think the fascist forces with the pro-people progressive forces, the communist, socialist party, etc., that have completely different objectives. And this confusion is deliberate, is an attempt to rewrite history. So I read here uh, something from Hitler, that when we understand that it's vital to understand Marxism, all means are good for our end. So a movement that must be geared to the broadest masses, the masses with which Marxism fights uh, to win over. So the masses are the force, are the source of all strength. If I can bring the masses to my side, who will be against me? So if we win, Marxism will be exterminated. When there is, we will not rest. If there is a single Marxist organization that we haven't eradicated, and until we have killed the last Marxist or re-educated. So this is not very different from what we hear from, from Bolsonaro in the electoral process. And this idea of, of enhancing fear, of feeding fear, fear as a mobilizing, mobilizing uh, force to, to, as well as anti-Semitism. There was this fear of communism in the 30s. Currently in Europe, it won't, it won't be anti-Semitism, but it's probably the anti-Islamophobia, -Isla sometimes even the terrorism, and so we nobody looks at nobody looks at the who arms and who funds these so-called terrorist movements. Very often, it's um, some of the main the great powers. So. This idea of feeding the fear that workers should have against the immigrants and then turning over to the fear of workers in general. So workers are the source of progressive forces, of resistance of the masses who uh, are not eluded by this kind of attempt. I'm talking about the unions, of course, the labor movement. We have a campaign in Portugal, a brutal campaign, through the mass media against workers' struggles. There's a very important set of struggles taking place in various sectors. And the headlines say, until Christmas, 47 strikes, trying to say that uh, it's the processes of workers' struggles are, uh, are negative, a pejorative way of referring to them. So it's not capital that oppresses them. It's not capital that uh, wants the precarious work and low wages. It's just that the people came together and decided to stop work to create problems. So it's neither a it's not as if people are losing their income because they're not earning their, their pay while they're on strikes. So workers are exploited, and this is never remembered. Not every struggle, worker struggle, is a progressive struggle, and we've seen that in the, Dan in the Portuguese context, the right-wing mobilizations m manipulating um, work working class struggles sometimes about the manipulation of work of human rights. 
very briefly. We in the European Parliament systematically are confronted with this issue of human rights. Human rights are today used by the right as a way to facilitate the interference and even aggression against sovereign states. So they create the conditions to maintain hegemonic positions, whether territorial or of control of resources, whether ores or oil or whatever. So they are used to justify wars against Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya. That was voted in the European Parliament, a resolution, or Syria. These are fed, for example, to promote and legitimize an intervention against Venezuela or other countries that state that they are against the interests of imperialism. Thank you very much, João Pimenta. The far right here wants to just eliminate Paulo Freire from schools. It says to workers that they are unemployed because there are other workers that are employed with too many rights, and they have to choose in between rights or jobs. And even with all the discourse, we see that uh, sometimes the historical enemies are immigrants, are the left, the Marxists, the communists, and that all makes us want to be in a front of resistance and organization and fight because, as Bertolt Brecht has mentioned, first they took the communists and then uh, the others, and at the time they came and I had nothing to defend to me. Maria do Rosario, well, I think that everyone that has spoken before me had quite significant things. But I'm going to address what Ricardo Carneiro mentioned, and if you excuse me. He brought something that was very important to us when he talked about the adherence of masses. Why are they buying something that is against them? Why are workers, someone that lives in the outskirts of town, in a rural area, uh, someone that uh, had access to rights they did not have before, like housing and income and education. Why did they join projects that were against them? Well, I will try an answer. I, I, I question that myself. I do not have all answers, but I'll try and think together with you about this issue. I believe, Ricardo, that today we had uh, a simplification from our opponents, uh, those that are against the sense of world and, and, and rights that we believe in, they produced a simplification of topics, and with that they provoked to what we call a cultural instrumentalization of beliefs. Um, and, and it's not that people always make rational decisions. There is another hypothesis together with that. Sometimes people think they are choosing the best for themselves because of a rational that was built. So it seems to them they are making right choices. So what I'm talking about, I'm talking uh, from my perspective uh, about topics like violence, uh, the enemies of uh, classes as a whole have really instrumentalized the issue of violence. People can no longer live with the talk of violence. In Brazil, we have more than 60,000 deaths a year. Most of them, we know, are youngsters. We fight against that. 
Well, it happens, though, that some created a speech in favor of them against the others based on a so-called violence. And they do not, they omit how much they contribute to this violence. People do not know that and can start to repeat the simplification of violence. A whole language was created about that. It is what we call a good citizen. They created language saying a good criminal is a dead criminal. And they put themselves as defenders of people. And we on the opposite side. So all the simplification is based on fear. And it expands the feeling of violence. I'm not saying violence isn't there. It is there. It's a real violence and dangerous. But then a whole discourse is built, isolating us with its own language, its own instruments of communication, the media and the social media. The media has not gone through a process of democratization. The media has not supported human rights. And we have the topic of family. Well, who is against family here? But family, in their connotation, has to do with one type of family. We have the statue of family that was discussed in the National Congress. And it is not true to say that you do not belong in a family if you're not part of that family. But what they say is that they are destroying the values of your family. Well, indeed, they are destroying the values of the families as they are. Uh, families not only of LGBTs that are entitled to their families, but families of mothers and children, grandparents and their children. All families have become clandestine in Brazil when this concept of a single family has been produced. But people joined the idea. The school without parties. Who wants political parties in schools, especially when they're saying that politics is dirty? So they say they are against corruption and they are against parties. No one is more unproductive as a politician than this person that was elected president. However, he is the paladin of uh, a political change. So I'm trying to make things rational, but fascism is not rational. Fascism is hatred, is the awakening of a feeling of repulse against the other, repulse against the left, repulse against the Indians, the blacks, the Jewish, the Islamism, because you are a woman misogyny, because you're gay, lesbian, trans, it is repulse against someone. And hatred is not explained. It just uh, is rooted culturally. And it has to be fought culturally as well. It's no use to have access to house, education, and sport if people are not political aware of things and if people do not have action. And I think this is where we failed. And I would like to conclude uh, also asking you to answer Suplicy personally. And why is that? Why am I going to answer him personally? I know your intention is the best as possible. You are a humanistic person. You are a person that loves the world and loves people. And I want to recognize you your work and your life. And so I'm answering uh, uh, Suplicy, but also us all. I understood with what, uh, uh, what you said about Bolsonaro. I always defended people, as you have. But it comes to a time that uh, you are attacked. And then you feel you are in a different place. Uh, 
uh, I started to understand at that point how a person that suffers violence from someone is linked to someone. It is very hard to get rid from an oppressor. It's very hard for a woman in a community where you become not only yourself, but the other, uh, the person to whom a husband did horrible things. I'm talking to you with all due respect. And of course, that my situation is incomparable to others that heard uh, that horrible president say things about a, one of the worst torturers, Austria, in Brazil. It's very hard, friend Genuino, to listen to all his attacks. It's very difficult for the families that says, said that he or someone paying homage to a torturer. But uh, I will say something to you. I understand that wherever I go in Brazil, people are going to tell me about him. But I also understood that I have to answer back. We, Brazilian women, have defeated him. And this is what I want to be remembered for. Yes, he won the elections. He did win the elections. He did win the elections in a twisted way or whatever. But I have the satisfaction to tell you that together with Brazilian women, we fought him three times in court, in the Supreme Court, and I'm still not rid of him, but I will, politically. Because you know, politically, when I talk about get rid of him, someone is going to record it and say, we are not paying for a defense lawyers of the guy. We didn't ask him to attack anyone. We are people that have to make this country be aware of this right wing, and it is the Brazilian people. The same people that made a mistake, they are going to make the country resume growth thanks to the work of the left. So we are not defeated. We had uh, political defeats, of course. We had electoral defeat, but we are still here. And we resisted. And our generation now has to resist the forms of dictatorship that appears under the shape of democracy. Lula free. Congratulations, Maria do Rosário. Thank you so much for such fantastic talk. And now, Jorge Tayano is going to close this wonderful panel this morning. Well, thank you very much. It's complicated to talk after Rosário. Uh, it's a, a tough job. I have three or four comments to mention. Well, first. I think there is a debate that uh, uh, the, la the Latin American left was engaged when we were talking about uh, making a revolution. And uh, what we called uh, the liberal democracy as a formal democracy, and we talked about substantive democracy. And this debate. Uh, as we were defeated uh, in our revolutionary intent and dictatorships uh, took place, was very much criticized by progressive sectors that would say, the only thing you're going to get with this analysis is to devalue democracy in general. And uh, one of the virtues of uh, liberalism and freedom 
and so you are going to, in the end of the day, favor the coming of dictatorships because democracy was too much challenged. In fact, uh, that is uh, the origin from since the transitions of democracy for him, nothing uh, changed in the left to talk about the differences. We would just talk about democracy without uh, making a deeper analysis of how we interpreted democracy. And that was accepted with certain, I wouldn't say uh, resignation, but some tactical elasticity. So let's talk about democracy in general, and let's not discuss the content of democracy. But there was one reality in the region, um, with exceptions, of course, but in the whole of the regions where the democratic transitions left to, to the democracy that we had uh, in place, that were challenged by progressive governments that wanted a more participative democracy. But now we are going back to democracies that in many cases uh, are very little participative and very little true representation of the population and very little mobilization. So, and the consequence of that is what we have, which is the degradation of the quality of democracy that uh, has really been regressing and uh, the threat to the welfare and uh, the police-like uh, uh, power and the judicial power that is also quite complicated. So this is what we have in place today. So we have to think of how we can again introduce topics that have to do with this deeper sense of democracy, which is uh, the participation of all its members. The second debate has to do with the connection between democracy and human rights. The Universal Declaration uh, turned uh, 100 years, and I would like to pay homage to women. Eleanor Roosevelt was one of the supporters of uh, the Declaration of Human Rights. And she was the widow of President Roosevelt. And because of her, there was a higher promotion of equality and the end of discrimination against women. And Eleanor Roosevelt had an important role in this declaration. These declarations were more or less signed by all the members of the United Nations, with a few exceptions. But uh, when you talk about political, economic, uh, and social rights in between the writing of the declaration and its approval, almost 20 years pass by, the pact of political rights and also the pact of economic, cultural, and social rights. So two different times in one declaration turned into two pacts. Why? Because it was the Cold War and the capitalistic Western world said we have to defend civil political rights that are important, that is, do not torture, do not kill, while the others have to have a more progressive character. While the countries in the socialist bloc said, no, here we have to ensure the minimum economic, social, and cultural rights of all peoples, and that is what is fundamental. And the fight against dominant classes has to be subordinate to this objective. That led to a conflict uh, that was quite extensive. And then basically what the, the Conference of Vienna after the fall of the wall in 93 and in the Conference of Rio, so one year after the, the Rio Conference, 
they talked about universal indivisible uh, rights. So we thought that the end of the Cold War would enable us to synthesize this uh, uh, contradiction. Well, what we have seen is that uh, Again, we see diversion pathways from this declaration. And uh, those countries that privilege uh, cultural, social developments are starting to struggle with political civil rights. So this is being reproduced with a peculiarity by using human rights, civil and political rights, as tools to justify interventions, the, the duty to protect, so-called. This is a derivation of the French principle of humanitarian intervention. The truth is that this is barbaric. The mechanisms, the regional universal mechanisms of human rights, particularly the regional ones, are resources that states use to uh, monitor and provide minimum standards. They shouldn't be used as arguments to violate sovereignty and make use of military force for intervention purposes. Because with that argument, what we would be doing is to naturalize the correct use of the, team, of the term. That's a big step back. In fact, progressive forces, poor people, democratic forces must not resign themselves. They should defend human rights, political, civil, economic, and social, and should denounce the use of the same rights with imperialistic purposes. Connected to this, there is something that I would like to mention, because just recently I was listening to Mr. Macron, President of France, about the yellow jackets, the, the yellow vest. Macron was saying, that the, the enemy of society, of civilization, is nationalism. I think nationalism is fascistic in Europe, but it's pro-people in Latin America. The US Americans use a concept which is positive, which is patriotism, and the others that do what they do in defense of their interests is nationalist, authoritarian nationalism. I think no, I think nationalism understood as the defense of people's participation, of the sovereign interests of people, of one's natural resources, and the ability to develop without foreign inter intervention is a very important political tool for the peoples of our region. And we don't have to give in to the right, because the rights, so-called nationalists, are actually looking for subordination to foreign powers. So lastly, a reference to the question of participation. So how do we achieve more participative societies? There's a complex uh, question there. What seems to me that we have to learn, at least in our case in Argentina, maybe this is relevant for other parts of the countries, is the conviction or the characteristics that many of our political processes in recent years were not just very statist, in terms of taking control of the state apparatus, but very often also, we don't like saying this, but they were van they were vanguardized, so to speak, uh, by the head of the executive branch. So this gave a, a brand of verticalism, top-down statist management. So more waiting around and less participation. 
So in our country, maybe in others, so we had social movements that grew. We had youth movements that grew, but we didn't have a, act, a policy uh, to educate new leaders of the labor movement. We didn't really help, we didn't propel this forward, and we didn't, forgive me, I'm Peronist, so Peron talked about the OLP, it's not the Palestine Liberation Organization, but so the free organizations of the people, Peron used to call the, that is where people power actually resided, and that was the need. We have a verticalist a tradition, Peronist as well, but the Democratic part, so very often we disagree among ourselves, of course, but the idea that the strengthening of the grassroots organization is very important. Social movements, the social movements, whether it's alternative media, student movement, labor movement, peasant movement, all of this has to be there. The scientists, organizations, the clubs, whatever. That is a way of rebuilding people power would be through fronts where we have not only political forces, but social forces and economic forces. We have to achieve a regrouping of all those that are, in our case, it's very clear. There is a minimum uh, national development, and they're destroying industry and jobs and n regional integration. Thank you, Tayana. So on behalf of the Percival Abramo Foundation, of the Lula Livre International Council Committee, the Workers' Party, the International Relations Department, we want to say a special thank you to your, for your participation. All our speakers, we invite you for lunch. And three at 1.30, 1.30 sharp, we will...